Hi, Dr. Alex here, and welcome to what I hope will be an enjoyable series to many people, although it may be of niche interest. Specifically, this series is transcribing the audiobooks of Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life, the Universe, and Everything, and So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, as read by Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore, for those who don't know, is the actor who played Marvin the Paranoid Android on the original radio production of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the TV series which followed soon after. This is the genuine Marvin the Paranoid Android, except no substitutes. When the radio series first aired in 1979, I was about five years old, and it was then repeated multiple times over several years on Radio 4, when it was first broadcast. My father was an avid fan of Hitchhikers as soon as it was produced, had the books, which I still have copies of, and listened to the radio series repeatedly, as did I growing up, to the point where I think I overtook my father in terms of my fandom for the series, and would insist that we listen to it whenever it was on, on a Saturday usually, around about lunchtime, and it just had to be on in the background so I could listen to it. Later, in school, having consumed the radio series multiple times and the books, I discovered the audiobooks in the school library, as read by Stephen Moore. And of course, I got these out and listened to them repeatedly as long as I could. Obviously, I had to take them back. They were, after all, library books on tape. Recently, I got to thinking about these books on tape and how enjoyable they were. Being read by Stephen Moore, it had the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android whenever he read the Marvin lines. And of course, the correct voice for the other characters that he also read in the radio series. And simply as a narrator, he has an excellent reading voice. So I remembered how much I enjoyed those as a child and then thought, I wonder if they're still readily available. As it turns out, they are not. They have never been produced on DVD or online. They only exist in that original tape form. And those tapes themselves are incredibly hard to find, as I discovered as I attempted to dig them out online from various shops and sources. I have now got all but one of the books. And hopefully by the time I get to the last book that Stephen Moore read, I should have all the tapes available. I would like to stress, I do not own the copyright for these tapes. I do not own the copyright for the original material, and I'm recording them in these videos in an effort to preserve them, because they are on magnetic tape, magnetic tape degrades, and there aren't very many of them left around as far as I can see, and there's been no effort to reproduce these professionally in another format, either online digitally or even just on CD. So if you do own the copyright for these, please, by all means, copyright claim these videos as the material is your own, but I would request humbly that you do not block them, just monetize them. My channel isn't monetized, so I'm not going to make money from this anyway, but I would like people, future generations, to be able to access these amazing recordings and enjoy Stephen Moore's work long into the future. Anyway, enough about my motivations for doing this, and now here is The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Cassette Side 4. I trust you had a pleasant meal, said Zani Whoop to Zaphod and Trillian as they rematerialized on the bridge of the starship Heart of Gold and lay panting on the floor. Zaphod opened some eyes and glowered at him. You! He staggered to his feet and stomped off to find a chair to slump into. He found one and slumped into it. I have programmed the computer with the improbability coordinates pertinent to our journey, said Zani Whoop. We will arrive there very shortly. Meanwhile, why don't you relax and prepare yourself for the meeting? And when this is all done, it's done, all right? I'm free to go and do what the hell I like and lie on beaches and stuff. Oh, it depends what transpires from the meeting, said Zani Whoop. Safe what? who is this man? said Trillian, shakily, wobbling to her feet. What's he doing here? Why is he on our ship? He's a very stupid man who wants to meet the man who rules the universe. Ah, said Trillian, a social climber. On a small, obscure world, somewhere in the middle of nowhere in particular, nowhere, that is, that could ever be found, since it is protected by a vast field of unprobability to which only six men in this galaxy have a key, it was raining. It was bucketing down, and had been for hours. It beat the top of the sea into a mist. It pounded the trees. It churned and slopped a stretch of scrubby land near the sea into a mud bath. 
The rain pelted and danced on the corrugated iron roof of the small shack that stood in the middle of this patch of scrubby land. It obliterated the small rough pathway that led from the shack down to the seashore and smashed apart the neat piles of interesting shells which had been placed there. The noise of the rain on the roof of the shack was deafening within, but went largely unnoticed by its occupant, whose attention was otherwise engaged. He was a tall, shambling man with rough, straw-coloured hair that was damp from the leaking roof. His clothes were shabby, his back was hunched, and his eyes, though open, seemed closed. In his shack was an old beaten-up armchair, an old scratched table, an old mattress, some cushions, and a stove that was small but warm. There was also an old and slightly weather-beaten cat, and this was currently the focus of the man's attention. Pussy, 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 coochie, 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 coo. Pussy want his fish. Nice piece of fish. Pussy want it. The cat seemed undecided on the matter. Pussy not eat his fish. Pussy get thin and waste away. I think, I imagine this is what will happen. But how can I tell? Pussy think, eat fish or not eat fish. I think it is better if I don't get involved. He left the fish on the floor for the cat and retired to his seat. Fish come from far away, or so I am told, or so I imagine I am told. When the men come, or when in my mind the men come in their six black shiny ships, uh, do they come in your mind too? What do you see, pussy? When I hear their questions, do you hear their questions? What do their voices mean to you? Perhaps you just think they're singing songs to you. Perhaps they are singing songs to you, and I just think they're asking me questions. From the table, he picked up a cigarette and lit it with a spill from the stove. He inhaled deeply and sat back. I think I saw another ship in the sky today, a big white one. I've never seen a big white one, just the six black ones, and the six green ones, and the others who say they come from so far away. Well, never a big white one. Perhaps six small black ones can look like a big white one at certain times. Perhaps I would like a glass of whisky. Yes, that seems more likely. He stood up and found a glass that was lying on the floor by his mattress. He poured in a measure from his whisky bottle. He sat again. Perhaps some other people are coming to see me. A hundred yards away, pelted by the torrential rain, lay the heart of gold. Its hatchway opened and three figures emerged, huddling into themselves to keep the rain off their faces. In there, shouted Trillian above the noise of the rain. Yes, said Zani Whoop. That shack? Yes. Weird, said Zaphod. But it's in the middle of nowhere, said Trillian. We must have come to the wrong place. You can't rule the universe from a shack. They hurried through the pouring rain and arrived wet through at the door. They knocked. They shivered. The door opened. Hello? Ah, excuse me, said Zani Whoop. I have reason to believe. Uh, do you rule the universe, said Zaphod? I try not to. Are you wet? Wet? Doesn't it look as if we're wet? Oh, that's how it looks to me, said the man, but how you feel about it might be an altogether different matter. If you find warmth makes you dry, you'd better come in. They went in. They looked around the tiny shack, Zani Whoop with slight distaste, Trillian with interest, Zaphod with delight. Hey, uh, what's your name? I don't know. Why, do you think I should have one? It seems very odd to give a bundle of vague sensory perceptions a name. He invited Trillian to sit in the chair. He sat on the edge of the chair. Zani Whoop leaned stiffly against the table, and Zaphod lay on the mattress. Wow-wee, said Zaphod, the seat of power. 
Listen, said Zani Whoop, I must ask you some questions. Zani Whoop pulled some notes out of a pocket. Now, he said, you do rule the universe, do you? Uh, how can I tell? Zani Whoop ticked off a note on the paper. How long have you been doing this? Ah, this is a question about the past, is it? Oh, how can I tell? That the past isn't a fiction designed to account for the discrepancy between my immediate physical sensations and my state of mind. So you answer all questions like this? I say what it occurs to me to say when I think I hear people say things. More I cannot say. Seyford laughed happily. I'll drink to that, he said, and pulled out the bottle of jank spirit. He leapt up and handed the bottle to the ruler of the universe, who took it with pleasure. Good on you, great ruler. Tell it like it is. No, listen to me, said Zani Whoop. People come to you, do they, in ships? I, I think so. And they ask you, said Zani Whoop, to take decisions for them about people's lives, about worlds, about economies, about wars, about everything going on out there in the universe? Out there? Out where? Out there, said Zani Whoop, pointing at the door. Well, how can you tell there is anything out there? Uh, the door is closed. But you know there's a whole universe out there, cried Zani Whoop. You can't dodge your responsibilities by saying they don't exist. You're very sure of your facts. I couldn't trust the thinking of a man who takes the universe, if there is one, for granted. I only decide about my universe. My universe is my eyes and my ears. Anything else is hearsay. But don't you believe in anything? I... Don't understand what you mean. You don't understand that what you decide in this shack of yours affects the lives and fates of millions of people. This is all monstrously wrong. I don't know. I, I've never met all these people you speak of, and neither, I suspect, have you. <laughs> They only exist in words we hear. It is folly to say you know what is happening to other people. Only they know if they exist. They have their own universes of their eyes and ears. Trillian said, I think I'm just popping outside for a moment. She left and walked into the rain. Do you believe other people exist? I have no opinion. How can I say... I'd better see what's up with Trillian, said Zephod, and slipped out. Outside, he said to her, I, uh, I think the universe is in pretty good hands, yeah? Very good, said Trillian. They walked off into the rain. Inside, Zani Whoop continued, But don't you understand that people live or die on your word? The ruler of the universe waited for as long as he could. When he heard the faint sound of the ship's engine starting, he spoke to cover it. It's nothing to do with me. I am not involved with people. The Lord knows I am not a cruel man. Ah, you say, the Lord, you believe in something. Uh, my cat, I call him the Lord. I am kind to him. All right. How do you know he exists? How do you know he knows you to be kind or enjoys what he thinks of as your kindness? I don't. I have no idea. It merely pleases me to behave in a certain way to what appears to be a cat. Do you behave any differently? <laughs> Please, I, I think I am tired. Zani Whoop heaved a thoroughly dissatisfied sigh and looked about. Where are the other two? What other two? Beeblebrox and the girl, the two who were here. I remember no one. The past is a fiction to account for. Stuff it, snapped Zani Whoop and ran out into the rain. There was no ship. The rain continued to churn the mud. There was no sign to show where the ship had been. He hollered into the rain. He turned and ran back to the shack and found it locked. The ruler of the universe dozed lightly in his chair. Various noises continued outside, but he didn't know whether they were real or not. He then talked to his table for a week to see how it would react. 
High in a tree, on the edge of a clearing, squatted Ford Prefect, lately returned from foreign climes. After his six-month journey, he was lean and healthy. His eyes gleamed. He wore a reindeer-skin coat. His beard was as thick and his face as bronzed as a country rock singer's. He and Arthur Dent had been watching the Golga Frenchens for the past week now, and Ford had decided it was time to stir things up a bit. The clearing was now full. Hundreds of men and women lounged around, chatting, eating fruit, playing cards, and generally having a fairly relaxed time of it. Their tracksuits were now all dirty and even torn, but they all had immaculately styled hair. Ford was puzzled to see that many of them had stuffed their tracksuits full of leaves and wondered if this was meant to be some form of insulation against the coming winter. Ford's eyes narrowed. They couldn't be interested in botany of a sudden, could they? In the middle of these speculations, the captain's voice rose above the hubbub. I would like to call to order the 573rd meeting of the Colonization Committee of Fintel Woodlewicks. Ten seconds, thought Ford, as he leapt to his feet again. This is futile! 573 committee meetings and you haven't even discovered fire yet! If you would care, said the girl with a strident voice, to examine the agenda sheet, you will see that we are having a report from the hairdresser's fire development subcommittee today. Oh, um, said the hairdresser with a sheepish look which has recognized the whole galaxy over as meaning, uh, will next Tuesday do? All right, said Ford, rounding on him. What have you done? What are you going to do? What are your thoughts on fire development? Well, I, I don't know. All they gave me was a couple of sticks. So what have you done with them? Nervously, the hairdresser fished in his tracksuit top and handed over the fruits of his labor to Ford, who held them up for all to see. Curling tongs. Well, you're obviously being totally naive, of course, said the girl. When you've been in marketing as long as I have, you'll know that before any new product can be developed, it has to be properly researched. We've got to find out what people want from fire, how they relate to it, what sort of image it has for them. The crowd were tense. They were expecting something wonderful from Ford. Stick it up your nose. Which is precisely the sort of thing we need to know, insisted the girl. Do people want fire that can be fitted nasally? And the wheel, said the captain. What about this wheel thingy? It sounds a terribly interesting project. Ah, well, we're having a little difficulty there. Difficulty, exclaimed Ford. It's the single simplest machine in the entire universe. All right, Mr. Wise Guy. You're so clever, you tell us what colour it should be. Ford shrugged his shoulders and sat down again. Almighty Zarquan, he said. Have none of you done anything? Captain, sir, permission to report, sir? Yes, all right, number two, welcome back and all that. We have discovered another continent, and we have declared war on it. Ford leapt to his feet. War, he said, on the next continent? Yes, total warfare, the war to end all wars. But there's no one even living there yet. I know that, but there will be one day, so we have left an open-ended ultimatum and blown up a few military installations. The captain leaned forward out of his bath. Military installations, number two, he said. Yes, sir. Well, potential military installations. Uh, all right. Uh, trees. And we interrogated a gazelle. Ford sat and idly tapped a couple of stones together. So, what else have you done? We have started a culture, said the marketing girl. One of our film producers is already making a fascinating documentary about the indigenous cavemen of the area. But have you noticed that they're dying out? Do you know what that means? Uh, we shouldn't sell them any life insurance, called out a wag. Ford ignored him and appealed to the whole crowd. Can you try and understand, he said, that it's just since we've arrived here that they've started dying out? Well, in fact, that comes over terribly well in this film, said the marketing girl, and just gives it that poignant twist which is the hallmark of the really great documentary. I gather that he wants to make one about you next, Captain. Oh, uh, really? Well, that's so awfully nice. 
He's got a very strong angle on it, you know. The burden of responsibility, the loneliness of command. Well, I wouldn't overstress that angle, you know. One's never alone with a rubber duck. At this point, the management consultant rose to his feet. If we could, for a moment, move on to the subject of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy? Policy, whooped Ford Prefect. How can you have money if none of you actually produces anything? It doesn't grow on trees, you know. If you would allow me to continue. Thank you. Since we decided a few weeks ago to adopt the leaf as legal tender, we have, of course, all become immensely rich. But we have also run into a small inflation problem on account of the high level of leaf availability, which means that, I gather, the current going rate is something like three deciduous forests buying one ship's peanut. Murmurs of alarm came from the crowd. So in order to obviate this problem, he continued, and effectively revalue the leaf, we are about to embark on a massive defoliation campaign and uh, burn down all the forests. I think you'll all agree that's a sensible move under the circumstances. You are all mad, explained Ford Prefect. You're absolutely balmy. You are a bunch of raving nutters. The tide of opinion was beginning to turn against him. Sensing this shift in the wind, the marketing girl turned on him. Is it perhaps in order to inquire what you've been doing all these months, then? You and that other interloper have been missing since the day we arrived. We've been on a journey, said Ford. We went to try and find out something about this planet. Oh, doesn't sound very productive to me. No? Well, have I got news for you, my love. We have discovered this planet's future. It doesn't matter a pair of fetid dingo's kidneys what you all choose to do from now on. Burn down the forest, anything, it won't make a scrap of difference. Your future history has already happened. Two million years you've got and that's it. At the end of that time your race will be dead. Gone and good riddance to you. Remember that, two million years. Well, said the captain with a soothing smile, Still time for a few more baths. Could someone pass me the sponge? I just dropped it over the side. A mile or so away through the wood, Arthur Dent was too busily engrossed with what he was doing to hear Ford Prefect approach. Ford watched quietly from beside a nearby tree. No, Q scores ten, you see, and it's on a triple word score. So, look, I've explained the rules to you. No, 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 look, please, put down that jawbone. All right, all right, we'll start again and try to concentrate this time. Ford leaned his elbow against the tree and his hand against his head. What are you doing, Arthur? I'm trying to teach the cavemen to play Scrabble. It's uphill work. The only word they know is grunt, and they can't spell it. Well, what's that supposed to achieve, asked Ford. We've got to encourage them to evolve. Can you imagine what a world would be like, descended from those cretins we arrived with? Imagine, said Ford, raising his eyebrows. We don't have to imagine. We've seen it. Arthur kicked at a stone. Did you tell them what we discovered? Norway? Slarty Bartfast's signature in the glacier? Did you tell them? Well, what's the point, said Ford. What would it mean to them? Mean? You know perfectly well what it means. It means that this planet is the Earth. It's my home. It's where I was born. Was, said Ford. All right, will be. Yes, in two million years' time. Why don't you tell them that? Go and say to them, Excuse me, I'd just like to point out that in two million years' time I will be born just a few miles from here. See what they say. I'll chase you up a tree and set fire to it. Face it, said Ford. Those zebes over there are your ancestors, not these poor creatures here. Put the scrabble away, Arthur, he said. It won't save the human race, because this lot aren't going to be the human race. The human race is currently sitting round a rock on the other side of this hill, making documentaries about themselves. Arthur winced. There must be something we can do. No, said Ford, there's nothing we can do. This doesn't change the history of the earth, you see. This is the history of the earth. Like it or leave it, the Golgofrinchians are the people you are descended from. In two million years they get destroyed by the Vogons. 
History is never altered, you see. It just fits together like a jigsaw. Funny old thing, life, isn't it? Poor bloody caveman. It's all been a bit of a waste of time for them, hasn't it? said Arthur. <coughs> muttered the native and banged on the rock again. Why does he keep banging on the rock? said Arthur. I think he probably wants you to scrabble with him again, said Ford. He's pointing at the letters. The native banged on the rock again. They looked over his shoulder. Their eyes popped. There, amongst the jumble of letters, were eight that had been laid out in a clear, straight line. They spelt two words. The words were these Forty two. Goo, 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 explained the native. He swept the letters angrily away and went and mooched under a nearby tree with his colleague. Ford and Arthur stared at him. Then they stared at each other. Did that say what I thought it said? They both said to each other. Yes, they both said. Forty two, said Arthur. You know what this means, said Ford. Forty two is the number Deep Thought gave as being the ultimate answer. And the earth is the computer deep thought designed and built to calculate the question to the ultimate answer. So we are led to believe. And organic life was part of the computer matrix. If you say so, I do say so. That means that these natives, these ape men, are an integral part of the computer program, and that we and the Golga Frinchans are not. But the cavemen are dying out. And the Golga Frinchans are obviously set to replace them. Exactly. So you see what this means? What? Cock up, said Ford Prefect. Arthur looked round him. This planet is having a pretty bloody time of it, he said. Ford puzzled for a moment. Still, something must have come out of it, he said at last, because Marvin said he could see the question printed in your brainwave patterns. But. Probably the wrong one, or a distortion of the right one. It might give us a clue, though, if we could find it. I don't see how we can, though. They moped about for a bit. Arthur sat on the ground and kept pulling up bits of grass, while Ford fiddled with his sub ether sensomatic. Ford, look. If that question is printed in my brainwave patterns, but I'm not consciously aware of it, it must be somewhere in my unconscious. Yes, I suppose so. There might be a way of bringing that unconscious pattern forward by introducing some random element that can be shaped by that pattern, like by pulling Scrabble letters out of a bag blindfold. Ford leapt to his feet. Brilliant, he said. He tugged his towel out of his satchel and with a few deft knots transformed it into a bag. They piled together all the remaining letters and dropped them into the bag. They shook them up. Right, said Ford. Close your eyes. Pull them out. Come on, come on. Arthur closed his eyes and plunged his hand into the towel full of stones. He jiggled them about, pulled out four, and handed them to Ford. Ford laid them along the ground in the order he got them. W, said Ford. H, A, T. What? I think it's working, he said. Arthur pushed three more at him. D, O, Y. Doy? O U G, do you g, E T, do you get? Do you get? Shouted Ford. It is working. This is amazing. It really is working. More here. Arthur was throwing them out feverishly as fast as he could go. I F, said Ford. Y O U, M, U L T, I P. L Y. What do you get if you multiply? S I X six B Y by six by. What do you get if you multiply six by N I N E six by nine? He paused. Come on, where's the next one? Uh, that's the lot," said Arthur. "That's all there were." You mean that's it?" said Ford. "That's it." Six by nine, forty-two. That's it. That's all there is. The sun came out and beamed cheerfully at them. The sound of voices lilted through the trees, followed a moment later by two girls who stopped in surprise at the sight of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent, apparently lying on the ground in agony, but in fact rocking with noiseless laughter. 
No, no, don't go, called Ford Prefect between gasps. We'll be with you in just a moment. What's the matter? asked one of the girls. She was the taller and slimmer of the two. On Golga Frinsham she had been a junior personnel officer, but hadn't liked it much. Ford pulled himself together. Excuse me. Hello. My friend and I were just contemplating the meaning of life. <laughs> Frivolous exercise. Oh, it's you. You made a bit of a spectacle of yourself this afternoon. You were quite funny to begin with, but you did bang on a bit. Did I? Oh, yes. Yes, what was all that for? asked the other girl, a shorter, round-faced girl who had been an art director for a small advertising company on Golga Frincham. For? <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> Nothing's for anything. Come and join us. I'm Ford. This is Arthur. We were just about to do nothing at all for a while, but it can wait. The girls looked at them doubtfully. I'm Agda, said the tall one. This is Mella. Hello, Agda. Hello, Mella, said Ford. Do you talk at all? said Mella to Arthur. Oh, eventually, said Arthur with a smile, but not as much as Ford. Good. There was a slight pause. What did you mean? asked Agda, about only having two million years. I couldn't make sense of what you were saying. Oh, that, said Ford, it doesn't matter. It's just that the world gets demolished to make way for a hyperspace bypass, said Arthur with a shrug. But that's two million years away, and anyway, it's just Vogons doing what Vogons do. Vogons? said Mella. Yes, you wouldn't know them. Where do you get this idea from? It really doesn't matter. It's, it's just like a dream from the past or the future. Arthur smiled and looked away. Does it worry you that you don't talk any kind of sense? asked Agda. Listen, forget it, said Ford. Forget all of it. Nothing matters. Look, it's a beautiful day. Enjoy it. The sun, the green of the hills, the river down in the valley, the burning trees. Even if it's only a dream, it's a pretty horrible idea, said Mella, destroying a world just to make a bypass. Oh, I've heard of worse, said Ford. I read of one planet off in the seventh dimension that got used as a ball in a game of intergalactic bar billiards, got potted straight into a black hole. Killed ten billion people. That's mad, said Mella. Yes, only scored thirty points, too. Look, said Agda, there's a party after the committee meeting tonight. You can come along if you like. Yeah, OK, said Ford. I'd like to, said Arthur. Many hours later, Arthur and Mella sat and watched the moon rise over the dull red glow of the trees. That story about the world being destroyed, began Mella. In two million years, yes. You say it as if you really think it's true. Yes, I, I think it is. I think I was there. You're very strange, she said. No, I'm very ordinary, said Arthur, but some very strange things have happened to me. You could say I'm more differed from than differing. And that other world your friend talked about, the one that got pushed into a black hole? Ah, that I don't know about. It sounds like something from the book. What book? Arthur paused. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. What's that? Oh, just something I threw into the river this evening. I don't think I'll be wanting it any more. <laughs>